Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. But you also flew on another squadron. Can you just tell us about this and your time after your Desert Storm time? Oh, okay. Then I went and, um, you know, trying to keep the family happy. Uh, my wife was kind of getting a little, okay, you've done this, you know, because she, when I was doing the, the Gitmo 2 and the A4, it's oh, a restricted yeah. base. And so she wasn't there for, for me, with me for a year and a half then. Then I immediately go right in the fleet and then go right on cruise. And I mean, I'm, it's to this day, it's a miracle I'm still married. I mean, I, yeah, she's an incredible woman. And, and the, 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 her dedication to now, the, you know, the Navy and the, the country, just to, yeah. to keep this, this idiot because it has a passion for flying. It's, it's a miracle for me. Yeah. So when it happened, a lot of my guys, uh, of course, you know, they got out and flew airlines. I just didn't want to give it up. But I need, I still wanted to keep my wife. So I started looking into some, some, some things I could do, and I found out there's this little secret uh, thing that, it was, um, that the Navy had was because they actually have a reserve. They have a Navy reserve where they can recall, and they did. They did it for um, Operation Freedom. But they also need full-time guys, active duty guys, to yeah. manage the program. So that's what I did. Was a, I, I uh, put an application in and became a, a uh, active duty reservist. Uh, and I went to fly uh, Tomcats out of um, Dallas. So that's, that was my next squadron. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. I, I got to see it because a lot of those guys were in Dallas were made up from um, – East Coast Tomcat guys, where I've been working with West yeah. Tomcat, yeah. Tomcat guys. So I got to see both coasts and stuff. And uh, and then I still got to, because of the training, that's how I was able to uh, get all the carrier time uh, on different carriers. You know, I, I did cruises on the Lincoln and the Enterprise, <clears throat> but then I got a lot of other carrier traps just to keep our currency up for the reservists. So that was kind of nice too. So that's why I ended up getting nine carriers, you know, uh, landing on nine different carriers. So that was. Well, I don't have a lot. Yeah, it was. It was. It was fun. It was. It was. It was a good deal. And then I kept my fan, my 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 wife happy because I didn't go on, on uh, carrier deployments. And it was a good. It was a good deal because it was again. It's all about timing. Because after remember, if you recall, after Desert Storm, suddenly there was a big. Um, they called the the peace dividend. Remember that? Because yeah. suddenly. There is no Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And what happens when there's a big peace dividend? The military just shrinks. And um, so what ended up happening was they started um, uh, disestablishing the aggressor squadrons out of the Navy, which I think is vital. You have to, you have to train uh, to, the, to the threat. God, I got, sorry. No worries. You, ha you have to change, uh, train to the, to the threat. So what, um, what ended up happening was they dissolved all the aggressor squadrons and they turned them over to the reserve squadrons. So suddenly now I'm uh, back into the uh, aggressor business, which, which I started off in flying the A4 and Q, which I love. So um, that's where I got, because uh, from, from the time we, we, we started training and qualifying our guys into um, the the aggressor mission, you have to it's a whole different you know mindset because you actually are learning you you learn and to fly like a threat. You're a threat pilot, so you you just don't fly like a you know. I mean, you still want to beat the guy, but you want to teach them and train them, and this is what you're going to see. So we study up on on you know the uh, threat pilot tactics. You know what what is a Soviet Union pilot going to How's he going to perform in, 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 the, in the ACM arena? Yeah. Uh, how is a North Korean going to perform? How's a Chinaman going to perform? Yeah. 
and so forth in all the uh, uh, the Middle Eastern threat countries as well. So it was it was fun. I mean, and we got our training because we got the training from the Navy's aggressor squadrons because they were going away. So they, you know, their, their their last big hurrah was all right. Let's train all these guys and, and qualify them. So that's what we're doing, and that's how I ended up because um, I just said when that all happened, I was wrapping up my my uh, VF two hundred one hunter tour from the Tomcat squadron out of Dallas, but we actually had a reserve air wing as well. Because again, you never know when you're going to need to augment the fleet with another air wing. So um, I went to my, I got selected to be on his staff as the Tomcat guy. Because, you know, the, the CAG, the Carrier Air Group Commander, he has all these airplanes, but he wants reps from each warfare specialty, excuse me, uh, platform. So I was going to be the Tomcat guy on his staff. And he's a great guy. Um, uh, top, uh, former Top Gun CEO, you know, good active duty. You know, again, it's 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 reservists, but active duty elements yeah, to yeah. manage to make it all work. And so I, I I checked aboard, and he goes, he goes, he goes, this, you know what? We're going, we're we're taking over the adversary business, which he loved too because he was a Top Gun guy. That's their that was their meat and potatoes. He goes, here's what I want you to do is I I know you're my Tomcat guy, but I need to get you I need to get you qualified in the Hornet. I mean, so he goes, you're going to be dual qualified when you're, you're on my staff. So I'm like, oh, my God. It just, just gets on getting better and better and better. I was like, I mean, if you can't be good, just be lucky. and Just get these great yeah. opportunities put in your lap. So that's what happened, ended up happening. Is next thing you know, they go, hey, you know, we got you an F-18 rag quota. And I was like, wow. And then he goes, yeah, but get this. It's only a, a, a Cat 4 quota. I'm like, uh, okay. Well, and, and what it is is rags have quotas. Uh, or, or different classes. A cat one is a guy, a brand new guy, just wing, learn, learning the, um, the the new weapons platform. Okay, so you get a full, and it takes a while. It takes you know, usually anywhere from six to, to twelve months to go through a, a rag, depending on the availability of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then you got a cat two. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a, you know, he has fleet experience, but he's been away from the airplane for a tour or something like that. That could be like an exchange pilot or, you know, or a shore duty, staff duty, something like that. Then a, th a third, uh, I'm trying to remember what a third one is. There's a whole different elements, but with each element, the training goes lower and lower, <laughs> lower and lower. It's like, you're only going to get, and by the time it gets to a cat four, it is like, okay, you go in. You get a couple simulators, you get a couple flights, you get 10 hours, and omni omni, you're called in that weapons platform. So you really don't learn the airplane. You yeah, really don't. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I was like, but hey, I was like, I was going to fly a Hornet, so I'll take it. So that's what I ended up doing. So I ended up going to the RAG, the East Coast RAG, and right there at Cecil, because that's where the air ring was, and got my big whopping 10 hours. And then the first thing I wanted to do was, like, okay, I got to start learning this airplane. And then there's rules and regulations in the Navy where, like, for, for us, was you actually had to have 25 hours of flight time in the, um, in the platform just to start getting the training, the, ab the aggressor training, because yeah. we're going to be flying our, our Hornets as aggressors. So, so immediately I got, as soon as I got out of the rag, I was like, okay, I, I got to get caught cross country. I just got to build up the 25 hour as quick as I can mm -hmm. and then uh, go and get, start getting qualified in that one. And, and then, um, and there's a funny story there as well. It's uh, a lot of people don't you know, know this one and it's, but it's so funny. I, I think your audiences will like it. it is, so what ends up happening is I get out of the rag and I contact this, you know, the aggressor squadron that, that I was planning on going to anyway. It's, it was the fourth generation aggressor squadron. They're still in existence today. Uh, they they had their hornets all painted up uh, like it almost looks like a big twenty nine. The same paint scheme and everything. They look they look really hot. And uh, and they're old lot hornets, so they don't have all the the because they're A's. And they, so in other words, they, they have a lot of capability to them because, you know, as you add more capabilities to the airplane, you start bubbling up the airplane, right? With all yeah, stuff, cool. which is drag. And it, yeah, so, so these things were, I mean, and I didn't realize that no one, I didn't get that memo, by the way. It's like, <laughs> hey, these aren't like the normal hornets, you know, these things, these things can, you know, they can super cruise, which they so could. So they were little hot rods. <laughs> Yeah, you, you could super cruise at altitude in, in military, not in burner. In military, you could go uh, speed of sound. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, super cruise. 
So I'm like going, and again, I didn't, I didn't get that memo. So, so what ends up happening is they, they go, Hey, I go, Hey, I, I gotta get some, I gotta get 25 horns, uh, horn times so I can start the, uh, qual the, the aggressor qualifications. Roger that. Hey, it just so happens we got a horn up here that we need to deliver to, uh, California for the, uh, intermediate, uh, de depot It's a big maintenance thing where they, sh they yeah, tear yeah. all. Yeah. So I said, perfect. I'll, a, I'll take it. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. They'll give me across the country, rack it up, that guy. Well, again, I'm still learning the airplane. I'm constantly, you know, and, and by the time, like I said, I was, uh, I was still flying the Tomcat, too. So I'm dual qualified. Yeah. And, you know, one day I'd fly the Tom, one day I'd fly the Horn. But, you know, again, I had most hours of the Tom, so I'm used to all the fuel specs and everything like that. Well, sure enough, so I, I'm going to drop her off, then I'm going to catch a red eye back to Florida where my my staff was, you know, where, where I worked. <clears throat> so I flight planned the whole thing out there and I'm like, okay, I'll go to, uh, you know, to NES at Oceana, to Memphis, to, uh, Albuquerque. And then, uh, actually, yeah, yeah. Three, three legs. I'll, that'll, that'll do it. So, you know, I knew, I knew the Hornet always had a rep had the reputation. It didn't have a lot of legs to it. Like the Tom does, you know, yeah. Tom can had that 20,000 pounds of fuel, you know, you'd stay up there and go for a long time. So sure enough, I get up there, I'm launching out. And I'm, I'm like, God, dog, I'm looking at my fuel stats. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to make it to Memphis. It's like, how? You know, it's like, man, they weren't kidding. This thing uh, doesn't have legs. So I had to go ahead and file a draft airborne and get a clearance to, to jump into Meridian. So then I jump into Meridian. And I'm like going, okay, it's like, can I make Meridian to Albuquerque? That's going to be tight. Let me see if I can do that. And so sure enough, I launch out and I'm I'm not going to make that either. So now it goes from three legs to four legs. So I go, oh crap. So I go jump into to Wichita Falls, uh, Shepherd Air Force Base, do a quick, brief fuel. And I'm like, okay, I can zorch to, uh, I know I'm not going to make it from Wichita Falls, which is in Texas, all the way to, to San, San Diego. So I'm going mean, to have to just zorch to, to Albuquerque and zorch from Albuquerque to, to, and still make my my uh airline flight my red eye back oh yeah, yeah. so sure enough so here's what i do i do a quick call and i said and just to get uh, albuquerque heads up like i need when i land you if you guys could be there to fuel me up real quick you'd be doing me a big favor and they, and they go well what are you talking about you can't come here i'm like well why not and he goes he goes no we got air force two coming the vice president's coming here the the, the field shut the field's shutting down oh. and i go you gotta be kidding me i go well I said, what, uh, what time do you arrive at? And he, he gives me a tan. I said, I, I can beat him there. I can get, I, I'll, I'll, I'll beat him there. Don't worry about that. I file, I launch out. I'm literally doing supersonic on the airways. That's, and that's, and I didn't mean to do it. I really, this is, this is, of course you did. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going military going, I was hoping to be doing like 0.999, you know, like that. Yeah. But I was going to say, cause you can't, you can't go supersonic on the airways. And yeah. so, um, but sure enough, I looked down one time, I'm like 1.1, I'm like, oh, shit, crap, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I'm, like, I'm going to be, I'm going to get, I'm going to get violated on this thing. So I had to squeak it back off mill. And anyway, so then I check in and they go, where are you going? You know, the, the approach goes, where are you going? I said, Albuquerque goes, no, you're not. Uh, Air Force Two is on approach. They're now. Oh. And I'm like going. Oh, and then so I slew my radar, pick them up. I said, I can beat them there. <laughs> so, and I literally, I, I, cause then they go and they're, they're, I'm starting to fight with the, the approach in there. And I finally said, Hey, look at, cause to doing all this, I had burned all my fuel. I said, I'm, I, I go, Hey, I'm, I'm minimum fuel. And like, okay, we understand you're declaring emergency fuel. I said, I didn't want to do that. You know, cause oh, now I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Decline of so I'd say negative, negative. I'm I'm minimal fuel, but I really, you know, and I and if I, he's getting so pissed, he goes, all right, just just get aboard. So I just I, I literally I literally cut off Al Gore in, in the Air Force too, which, which I love to this day because I can't stand that. That's guy. a great story. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, land yeah. there and then get refueled, get out of there. And I thought for sure I was going to hear all about all this. Never heard a word. Not, no a word, not a word about the supersonic the airways, not a word about cutting off Air Force Two. I thought for sure the Air Force guys were like, hey, dude, what are you doing cutting us off? And not a thing, man. So not until now, anyway.
<laughs> yeah, made, made a great story. Yeah, yeah. They don't know who they Wow, what a story. So, uh, yeah, did you like, so you got like, yeah, I'm guessing a hot fuel and you were back out? Uh... Well, the, 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 no, the funny thing about that was I land and there, now the ground control controller is even pissed off. He's like, okay, you know, <laughs> where are you going to go now? The, you know, we have secured yeah. <laughs> the whole base. So I'm like going, and I look over and I see like this hangar rear and it's like an army. I think they got a helicopter, army helicopter. And I said, I'll take the, um, the army hangar over here. And I said, Hey, can you, and can you give the, uh, the fuel guys a call? <laughs> so, so Larry, I went and, and taxied there and they had no idea who this, this Hornet, this, this aggressor mid looking like Hornet coming up. Who, where, what is he doing? Who's taking care of this? And, and they had no idea. And so literally what happened to happen when I taxied myself, stopped, opened up, walked on the airplane, walked on the wing, all the way to the end of the wing, jumped <laughs> off because yeah, I couldn't, you know, you have to have someone open up the stuff. And I jumped yeah. down just as, just as a car and a Jeep pulls up and goes, sir, what are you doing here? I said, I got a phone. <laughs> I said, Give the fuel guy a call. Get him out here as soon as possible. And and luckily, I mean, he just said, I don't know. yes, sir. You know, it's, so it was. It's just it was a crazy flight. But you know, and I did said, you take off in a full afterburner, so just to make sure everyone knew you were landed there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because because now now my, my next big worry was, am I going to make the my airline? Yeah, yeah, next. And now, yeah, and that's another story. But that, it's it's I still bottom line, I still I still made it barely. That's brilliant. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so how, what was it like to uh, fight the Hornet in DSET, ASCM compared to the F-14? Um, well, okay, <laughs> there is, uh, if, if I'm going to be in a, uh, in a dogfight, I'd rather be in a, uh, a Hornet because that thing can fight like you would not believe. I mean, it's just the turning capability, the, 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 the great than one-to-one -one thrust ratio. Now, here's the only problem with that is um, one thing about the, you know, I'm, you could always beat a Tomcat in a Hornet. And there, there, there's no <laughs> there's no contest. I mean, even, the, I mean, uh, unless you're fighting a guy like uh, Snort Snodgrass, you know, which he you know, was the highest Tomcat guy, and he would he would actually take Hornets on a 1v1 and beat them. Oh, but he had his, I heard he was pretty good. Oh God, he's 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 incredible. I bet he has he had some neat tricks that, uh, yeah, you know, we were we couldn't do those tricks. He could he could get away with it. Yeah, he <laughs> could get still, away with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, he's throwing the big boys down. If I ever did that, and I, I got caught, yeah, that, you know, the big boys means the big flat, flaps and yeah. stuff. So no, but you you know you, you can beat it, but you got to do all this other stuff to make it a a, a true BFM monster. Uh, normally you can't. It's just the the, the thrust to weight ratio, uh, the energy that the, the Hornet has. It's a great slow fighter, everything. Um, so in that aspect, the only problem that I actually had to get used to to fight in the Hornet was was the G because in the Tomcat. Because of only having about a 0 0.8 something, 8 to 1 thrust, thrust to weight ratio, you burn. You burn all that energy. You get a yeah. first couple turns. Yeah, you're pulling, you know, 7.5 Gs or 6.5 Gs. And, uh, but you, you bleed. And so next thing you know, no matter how hard and how, how much zone 5 after burn you're placed in this thing, you're going to be probably pulling about 4 Gs. That's about yeah. all she can give you. Mm -hmm. uh the hornet no it's seven and a half sustained g and this is where the story i was going to tell you about where yeah you get you get smarter especially when you have responsibilities and you, you know when i had my, my first son was born but you still do some crazy stuff because i got used to it because what ends up happening when you're when this is seven and a half sustained g pretty soon guess what ends up happening and that's why a lot of guys were were killed this way is is uh g block uh blackout because what ends up happening you pull so much g all the blood just pulled away and you you basically go unconscious and then they, they crash and die i had a, had a friend that, that died that way so um but here's what you end up doing is I, I, I kind of found a way to manage that as well. Because you're in a dogfight and you're just pulling this and you're, you're in a one circle fight and you're just across 
you know, a, a, across the circle and no one wants to give up because you want to beat that guy. You know, it's all about reputation. Yeah. And you're fighting, fighting, you're pulling sad cheese. Well, pretty soon, guess what ends up, ends up happening is your vision starts going like this. And you're, you're pretty soon, it's, you, you have no peripheral vision anymore. It's just black over here or grayish. And it's gray, gray, and all of a sudden it starts turning black. And then pretty soon, all you can see is just like a little, little pin of light. Wow. About the size of that pin light going straight forward. That's all you can see. Now you can still hear, and I'm still flying, and I know the guys over here. So that's we. And literally, I would fight certain times, and I guarantee you a lot of other guys did the exact same thing. And you just don't fess up to it. I'm fess yeah, up yeah. now because it's been a long time since I did. It. But you sit there and fight until guess what? And suddenly, when it goes when it goes like this, it, it, you know when it's just about ready to go out. And then you just basically, hey, and you just come up, hey, let's just knock this off. We're not going anywhere in this. Mm-hmm. And the, I guarantee you he's the same way. He's like, yeah, yeah, let's just knock this off. <laughs> yeah, good call, good call, man. Yeah, good call, good call. <laughs> but that, yeah, that but that airplane was was a beast in the uh, in the in the in the uh, ACM arena. Now I will go back to you if it was in wartime and you actually had BFM uh, beyond visual range capability. No, I want the Tom. Because the time you can just shoot those guys down so far away, and actually, in a big multi arena ACM engagement time, you really need this in the second pair of eyes. That's um, that that's a big plus on on that one. But you know, hopefully that the, the whole battle space is different there. It's it's not so confined when you're when you're just doing a one v one dogfight. Now nah, you don't want the hornet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, just a bit of technical stuff. How, how did you find, uh, yeah, coming from the top uh, Tomcat uh, cockpit, which is, you know, half digital to almost at the modern point where I'm guessing it was three glass screens, yeah, wasn't there? How did that feel? That's, 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 a, that's another great story. <laughs> you're, you're bringing up another great story here. Go for uh, it. Yeah, you're right, because it was very, very hard to go from analog to digital. Because I, but you know, by the time I'm flying the Hornet, you know, I've already been in the Navy. You know, I started the transition and uh, got in the Navy and uh, started flying in '84 in the Navy, uh, from the tra- in the training, and then on up into the, into the fleet. And then I didn't start flying the Hornet until '95, I think. '90. So it'd been a while, you know. I, I mean, I, I crewed a lot, yeah, hours and experience there, and. Um, with that is is all analog. Everything I was used to watching the steam gauge engines where you're seeing you know the altimeter yeah. like that, and suddenly now I mean the Hornet where everything is like you know you got the 3D eyes and then you got the HUD. Everything is all digital. There is no analog. There is no nothing to reference, and it took a lot to get used to. And when I was going to the racks, so the hardest thing I found was like. I kept on busting altitudes. You know, they, you know, when you're in the trainer, you, you guys are like, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're clear to, you know, 10,000 feet. Well, next thing you know, I'm like going, I'm approaching 10,000 feet and I'm like, oh shit. And I'm having to do this big, you know, because yeah. you see it in an analog steam gauge where you kind yeah, of yeah. know you have to do a nice little smooch. When they're numbers, they're just like, like yeah, that. Yeah. And it's, so it, it really was hard for me to, to adapt roll over in from analog to digital and it really happened when i was this is when i was trying to build up those hours i think i was I had maybe like 11 12 hours and i talked to one of the uh the the, the uh, reserve uh horn is a horn squadron it wasn't an aggressor it was you know it was paint up gray they did all the ready to go to the fleet if need be yeah and but they're right there at cecil where um <clears throat> the uh staff was so I called the guy up. I I cruised with him on my he was in my airroom and when I was flying top, so he's a buddy of mine. I said, dude, I need some I need some flight time. I need some flight time. He goes, Come on over, you can just take a flight, you take a horn up there, just just do, you know, go do some maneuvers and stuff and just log some time. Roger. So I'll go there, man up, and it's just a low, low overcast. It's in Cecil, it's in Florida. It's more you know, it's a Monday, uh, yeah, it's a morning overcast layer, a little bit of a drizzle and stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, no big deal. You know, I know it's going to clear up on top and stuff. Yeah. So I get in there, I get to the get to the uh, runway, hold short, ask for clearance for takeoff. As I take, they, they give me clearance for takeoff. As I take the runway and get ready to, to to take take off, they say, uh, and this call sign was Dolphin at the time, Dolphin 305, uh, uh, 
you're, you're not no longer clear for takeoff. We have a P3 on GCA file to Jacksonville. We're going to have to hold off. And I said, and again, the cockiness is just, it's, it's amazing. I'm still alive today. So I said, I said, well, what's his altitude? And, you know, and he told me his altitude. And I said, no, I'm fine. I can, I can, I can, I can be, I can be 8,000 feet by the end of the runway. Don't worry about it. Just give me clear, give, give me, unrestricted, give me unrestricted climb clearance. I'll, it's not an issue. He goes, oh, okay. Roger, you're clear for takeoff. Unrestricted climb. Unrestricted climb is, you know, I mean, burnt, full burner. Just, yeah. Like well, that. Yeah. So that's what I do. Well, I go in, and I'm thinking all it is is a, it's a layer of, of, of clouds. Well, guess what? It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was a thick layer of clouds. And I'm going up, up, and I'm like, oh, why am I not getting out? And I'm, so I'm, you know, <laughs> and I'm looking through the HUD. Remember, there, all the, ed, the attitude indicators are through the HUD. Yeah, there, there's, and then you look down here, and you got the, you know, the data display in the carriage, but has all those other, you know, the radar, everything else, but you got no attitude indicator other than the HUD, and I get the worst vertigo of my I've ever had flown. I just like I'm just not used to it. I haven't acclimated to the digital flying yeah. yet, and I'm like, oh, I got vertigo, and I'm like, oh my god, and all I could think about was. There has to be a standby gyro in this airplane somewhere. And they in the Hornet, there was. In case everything goes down, you actually have an old peanut, they, we call them peanut gyros. Right. And you go back to analog. And so what ended up happening was I uh, just uh, I just to try to get out of vertigo, I just had to find the the, the peanut gyro. And in the Hornets, they're all different. Sometimes they're over here, sometimes they're so now I'm looking and I find it, and now I'm having to fly. <laughs> like going like this, I'm having to fly down here because I find a little peanut jar there, and I'm able to get my back my where I'm where I am and level off. But it, it is I really thought I was, I was going to bite the farm on that one. I wow. to have vertigo is the worst feeling ever in an airplane. And after that, I said I got to get used to this digital flight control because. I'm going to I'm going to kill myself on this thing. Especially so. when you're going full burner in a Hornet. Uh, yeah, you need yeah. to you need to know where you are. I guess <laughs> you really got out of burner. You know, like okay, I got <laughs> I, I got to get I got to get control of this thing quick. You know. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, Mark, because uh, I want to crack on with what you did after uh, you left the military. But uh, so, how long did you spend on the F F fourteen and F eighteen? Oh, uh, let's see. I, I, you know, my my tour in Gitmo was only a year and a half tour, so I only got about 480 hours in the A4, but I loved it. And a lot of that too is because it didn't have a lot of gas, and a lot of them were uh, aggressor adversary yeah. missions, so they're like 1.0. So that's the reason why that turned out to be that way, because I got a lot of flights, a lot of experience, but about only 480 hours in, in the A4. The Tom, I went, I flew from 80. Uh, I want to say 88 to about 95, I think. And then uh, that one, I got 1,380 something. Um, is you know, okay. wow. so, so, something short, something short of, of 14, but it's one three something like that. And then um, the Hornet, I end up getting close to 700. Didn't quite make 700. It's like six, again six. Eight high eight, something like that. I can't remember. It's all in my logbook. <laughs> yeah, let's get in some personal questions here, Mark, before uh, we finish the interview. So, what did you accomplish um, uh, in your military career apart from flying? When I was on Admiral Staff, when I was uh, writing the whole, um, we did the, the actual. Naval Reserve took over the whole um, aggressor program for the United States Navy. All the um, all the Navy uh, strike fighter and fighter squadrons actually had to come through the uh, the adversary DACT training, the SFARPS, uh, and then and then you had to go on to do air wing training and, and strike mission training up in Fallon, where the big war games have gone. Where we always provided the the aggressor dissimilar uh, air combat training for that, 
And so then and that's in, when I was dual qualified. So I was flying both the Tom in an F, it, it is a, like a SU-27 role, flying the, the Hornet as a MiG-29 role. It was, you know, it was an experience of a lifetime doing it. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun. And then, and so what ended up happening, and then just out of suddenly my, uh, my boss, like, you know, CAG, he comes walking in the building, come, I mean, into my office and shakes my hand. He goes, congratulations, you've just been uh, uh, awarded from the ANA, which is the Aviation, uh, aviation oh God, what does ANA stand for? It's Naval Aviation Award, uh, Association. That's why I think it's right. Aviation Naval Association, Aviation Naval ANA. So anyway, what ended up happening was they got uh, they name uh, certain pilots every year, and, and I I was like the the tactical pilot of the year thing for for this is like '96. So they, they next thing you know they're they're flying my whole family up to D.C. Wow. for this big luncheon. I'm meeting congressmen, and they they're giving me my little trophy and cool. and stuff. So that, that that so that was fun. I mean, I didn't wasn't expected, but you know I you know I was like, well, you surely got the right guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that's, so that was um that was that was one thing. Um, you know, again, I just a lot of it I just think was luck. Well, it just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And, uh, it's very strange. A so, lot of like pilots, Necri, I'll say that it's always luck. And they, like some of them say, "I'm not. I wasn't the best pilot. I wasn't the best air crew." They always say it's a bit of luck. But I always think, nah, you must be really good at your job. You must have been good to get to that point. You know what I mean? Maybe it's your modesty coming through. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. The, like, the, I'll just say this: there are a lot of guys, there are a lot of guys better than me. That's that's one thing, and you, and you realize that you know where you are in the hierarchy because there will be certain guys you fly against that you can never beat. No matter be how, like, oh. you, <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 some of them are my best friends, so I, I got no problem with that. You know, yeah, it's just, absolutely. But you 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 have to you know there there's a Peter principle to everything in life. So yeah, absolutely. But, but uh, Mark, you've always ha uh, had a, an amazing uh, film career because some of the movies uh, that you've put out, uh, uh, Hun Pilots, Hood Pilots, Tom Cat Tales, which we can see in the back. Uh, tell us how you got into this industry. Well, uh, the funny thing about it was um, I just have loved movies since I was a kid. I watched all, you know, when my dad was off in Vietnam, I'd be going with my buds to movies theaters and we were paying 35 cents for the ticket at the base theaters. And so right. every movie came out, you know, oh my God, all the Clint Eastwood movies in the 60s, you know, yeah. uh, or Eagles Dare, Blue Max, 633 Squadron, Battle of Britain, you know, yeah. some of the stuff. It's just incredible movies. And I said, I would love to make a movie one day. And so, and I thought about it for, for a while, but, but, you know, I said, nah, I, I gotta fly first. So that's why I ended up doing it. I, I always put it off that I'd eventually do it. So what ended up happening was I ended up uh, using my GI Bill uh, to go to film school. So when I retired from the Navy, basically, you know, went to, to LA film school, got another bachelor of science degree in digital filmmaking, and then just started making movies. Of course, the first movie I really, uh, I made other movies, but the, the first feature, I mean, I made shorts and stuff. And I actually had to do some um, uh, films when I was in film school as part of the, you know, yeah. the educational part of it. And uh, they did real well. And then, but then I, my first feature was, uh, I want to do the story about, you know, my dad. And so I did Thud Pilots. And then that one, of course, went on to win uh, the GI Film Festival. And, okay. and then it did really, really well. I got picked up and got distributed and, and stuff. And then uh, next thing you know, I get a, a call from a general who's a, a F-100 pilot. He goes, and he, he runs the uh, the the, society, the, uh, the Hunt Society, I think it is. It, you know, it's a group for the yeah, F-100. Yeah. He goes, hey, sorry, movie third pilots, we want one just for the Hunt. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, it's so funny you mentioned that because my, my dad, he also wrote the book Hunt Pilots. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was planning to do that anyway. And he goes, well, get with me. I can get you all the best guys to tell their story. And I said, wow. okay. I said, well, you know, here's the thing. It's like I'm right in the middle of – and at, at that time, I was making the movie uh, Libertas, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And we were going to go shoot on location uh, in Normandy on the 75th anniversary. Wow. So I said, right now I'm, I'm tied up in, that, in, the, in production with that one. But as soon as I get done, I'll do that. And then sure enough, what ended up happening was uh, because some of the interviews were in the same city or excuse me, same state. I said, oh, again, for uh, for efficiency and for, again, budget 
because you, you know you don't want to make two trips when you can do it all in one. Uh, I started filming hunt pots because a lot of the guys had retired in uh, uh, the retired in Tucson because that's where a lot of the hunts flew out of. Uh, you know that's where their rag was, their F- FTS. So I you know I had a great time in the studio talking with those guys. They're they're incredible, uh, you know, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. And that one, believe it or not, just got is is going to be in this year's GI Film Festival, and it got nominated for two. Got nominated for for two awards and and this year. Congrats, Mark! I'm sure it's. Uh, I mean, I still need to watch that. I've watched everything else, but not Hun Pilots yet. So I'm going to have to get on that. But congratulations on that. Yeah, and if your audience wants to uh, see it as well, they, it's going to be the, this year because of COVID. They're they they had to make the um, um, the festival digital or, or virtual rather. Yeah. So it's all going to be virtual with. Uh, the Q and A afterwards. Um, I'm gonna try and get my dad, and then um, it's a kind of basic Zoom. But the, you'll you'll see it all online. And if you just go up to uh, GI Film uh, GI Film Festival SD dot org, I think that's it. it. But yeah, if you just GI Film, you'll find it, and then it has all the information uh, on that one as well. Yeah. So yeah. It's been busy, and then and then you know, of course, I I wanted to make the movie about the Tomcat because you know all the guys like, okay, you're making all these Air Force documentaries. How about hey, how about you those guys about something? <laughs> so I said, oh yeah, and, and that's and that was a blast. I uh, I, I shot that in uh, in two states, shot it up at, during tail hook, and uh, okay. had a blast seeing, seeing some of the guys because you know again it made it real simple. I didn't have to travel around different states because it gets real expensive getting the film crews there or whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I did that up there. And then the guys I couldn't get up a tail because that couldn't make tail. I got down to here in the, in the studio in California and, and we shot, we shot all that. And, uh, and that one's out distributed doing real well. So if anyone wants to see that, you can get on Amazon, Tubi TV, uh, paper, pay-per-view. It's all on that one. It's a whole website on that one. I can, I can maybe give you that and you can put links down there. Yeah, we'll get all the links for you guys in the description below. But uh, So what's next for you? Well, um, I'm right now in protection. I got, that's why I had another meeting here. I've, I've, got, I've got to meet with the... Um, uh, working with the, uh, the CGI uh, because the, the movie I'm doing next is uh, Thud Pilots 2. Because a lot of people, when they when they saw Thud Pilots one, they go, uh, "Where's where's, Where, where's the next bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah, where's the next one?" Yeah, and yeah. I was like, "No, I was already, you know, I already started production in the other movies." I said, "Well, okay, we'll we'll, we'll get there." And, and we finally finished up uh, shooting Thud Pilots two. Now we're in post production, but the problem is, I'm finding that one, the, some of the stories in this particular Thud Pilots two is so unique that I I have to CGI the B roll. Because before I could just just you take B roll that's you know it's in the archive you got yeah, some stock great footage, stuff yeah and you can just put it in there to kind of augment to, to visualize the story but these stories are so unique you know that I was like oh, no I'm gonna have so they to need a visual uh, like yeah that's not I out gotta there. yeah I gotta have to CGI I mean I got this one story about the the uh, the first successful Sam raid you know there were there are three Sam raids in Vietnam uh, the first the first one was, was, was my dad yeah yeah know, it was that, yeah. But yeah, and then the sec- but the first two were unsuccessful. The first Sam raid that actually knocked out the Sam's because the first two basically the the um, the Vietnamese had knew knew about it. They were just they were just flak traps. They were just bamboo uh, fake Sam sites. Well, no, we finally got it because we got smart. And the but the Air Force it was like, hey, how's the Navy doing this? And the Navy actually had the boxes that could could uh, pick up the, uh, the 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 Sam radar. And so what they ended up doing was, for that particular mission, they brought in an A4 from the um, from the risking, I believe it was, uh, and he led the mission. So he this little tiny A4 led the mission of of, of something like uh, eight buds. In wow. it's a great story, but but there was no pictures of anything of this mission. So I said, I got to CGI this, you know, I, I want, I want people to see the different sizes of the A4 and the thuds and stuff. And, and the, and, and the thud pot, he tells a story. He just, he tells it beautifully and stuff. And then, uh, so that, so that one, um, also my dad's story is told his first, the first, so you're going to hear about the first, uh, mission, the first attempted mission, which kind of built the hunter killer mission, the, uh, yeah. the CI, you know, you know, the suppression of uh, air enemy defenses. 
Uh, so that kind of start, lays out the groundwork and then it finishes off with the first successful uh, 100 kilo mission. And then uh, there's other stories as well that I said, oh, I got to get CDA on this one too. You know, some some just really cool stories. And uh, so that's what I'm doing right now. And I uh, should be wrapped up. Uh, it'll be released this year. So I figured out how long it's going to take. But I, I'm going to focus on it being released this year in 2020. Excuse me, 2020. If you keep me updated, I'll uh, link all the... Uh... You know the links you want me to uh, in our description and I, our viewers. I tell you, what, I, you buddy, you, you, you know, I, I love your program. I love, I love your interview, with my dad. I, I know you're gonna have a great interview with my brother. What I'll do is, uh, when I finally get it released, I'll send you a sneak, uh, sneak peek preview, oh, wow. a prior preview. Oh, see I'm forward to that. Yeah, and then uh, I'll give you all the information, so then you can, uh, you, you know, you know, do your own, do your review, because it's all about word of mouth. That's how, that's how great movies uh, become successful. It's just when someone says, "Oh man, you, you got to see," just, just like my, my dad says, "You got to go see the final countdown." And you know, yeah, exactly. Like what and it, you're like, yeah, and you switch on. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Mark, do you have any hobbies? Okay, the, yeah, the hobbies I have are well. Film. I just I love watching movies. The only problem with becoming a filmmaker and a, and a producer, and, and like I said, I, I formed a Speed Angels uh, film company, and that's how what drives all these films being made. Um, but I just the only problem with be, ha, having become a filmmaker is I, I don't look at movies the, the same way anymore. Um, now I become the technocrat of movies. You know, before I just watch a movie, I just enjoy it. No, now I'm like going, oh, who did the color here? Oh, who did the editing here? Oh, who did who wrote the script for that? You know, it's like, it's kind of a shame because I kind of lost that passion because now you just become a, just almost like a critic because, because that's what I do on all my films. I will sit there. In fact, my dad's constantly goes, you're too hard on yourself. Cause he'll, you know, he'll, he, he sees all the, the sneak views of the scenes yeah. as I do. And they go, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess this one's still got a lot of ways. What are you talking about? That's great. Goes, no, no, no. You know, so you, I always find something wrong. With and yeah. so that carries on. Uh, the other thing is music. I just love, you know, I've been uh, all through high school uh, and college. That's how I got to college was I was in rock band. Uh, oh. My brother's same rock band my brother was in we, we both formed these bands and and uh had a blast uh playing them we still play to this day we jam you know every year and uh it's it's a lot of fun and my my son he um he took and follows you know his his dad's footsteps he's in a in a rock band and they're like working on i think their fifth cd now in fact actually did you did you hear the music in tonka house they did the whole yeah, Score. I was going to say, like, yeah, was that was that all there? That's, yeah. Was that, yeah, it was really cool, like, there. rocky stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the only difference is the, um, the – I used some of his rock, but I love the, their, their compositions, but I couldn't use some of it the way it stood because it's, like, heavy metal rock. So I contacted my brother, uh, and, again, he's a musician. He's in, like, in five bands right now. He wow. plays in the – Oh yeah, he, you you definitely want to talk to him on that on that on, on the <laughs> interview. They're very, they're they're incredible. What he did was um, he took those uh, those songs and basically film scored them and made them into you know where instead of rocking you know guitars it's like that one it was violins pianos and stuff like that uh, one. Very he, he actually like i said all the songs in there are are uh silent vice that's the name of, of my, my son's band and except for the one i don't know if you remember how the uh, tomcat tale ends it is a tribute to all those that lost their lives and it's 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 a very uh, ominous sounding. I have know, to rewatch that because it was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But I'll, I'll rewatch that definitely. It's called. He calls it the Tomcat Taps. You know because it's, it's like taps. a. Oh. Yeah, because it's like a taps to to yeah, all those. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, composition. And, and then my brother, he wrote that and, and and did all the recording for that one too. So a couple of more questions before we let you go here, Mark. Favorite aircraft you have flown. Oh man, you know the problem. I know it's I, a hard I get one. The question all the time, and, the, and here's here's my answer to it. And is the um, it, it's almost like asking a, a parent, "Who's your favorite kid?" I know. <laughs> you know, is. you love them all. You do. I I love every one of the airplanes, I've, including even the T two, the T two. Which when I first said, I, I, I looked at that airplane, I, go, I gotta fly that thing. It's the ugliest airplane ever made. Have you seen Was the T two? 
The Buckeye, yeah. yeah. It's the ugliest thing. It was so old. But that was the intermediate jet training when I was getting my wings. I mean, you, you start off in the T-34, you go to the T-2, you go to the A-4, boom, you get your wings. Well, the T-2, it's a killer. In fact, it's so much I would love to buy one. You know why I would love to buy one? It's the only jet. That you can do a spin, a flat spin, I've heard and that recover. Before. Yeah, yeah. It, can even, it can even do a launcherbach. And and what happened was uh, the Navy picked up on. I don't know if you recall back in the eighties, the uh, we started losing Tomcats left and right. I mean, the joke was, hey, we're going to try to plant them all, see if we need some more to grow, because mm-hmm. they were just they were crashing yeah. them left and right. A lot had to do uh, for out of out of control flight. Guys were just pushing it beyond the envelope. And the, the Tomcat, she was a beautiful airplane, um, but she was a very unforgiving airplane. She when she, you know, she would tell you, don't do this, don't do this. Enough. I'm not going to like what gonna, I'm going to do to you. And yeah. so you basically you, you had to learn to read and fly the Tomcat and honor her. Because she had all the control, <laughs> and uh, so so what ended up happening was the Navy and their wisdom said, you know what, we're going to keep on losing uh, more Tomcats and the valuable human resources that we invested millions of dollars to train if we don't get our hands hands wrapped around this out of control stuff because it's just the nature of, of the beast when you're a dog right? You're going to you're going to push it beyond the envelope because no one wants to lose. There's no points for second place, you know? Yeah. So uh, what they did was, in their wisdom, they uh, they went to the aggressor squadron. And right here, is, uh, both in Oceana and Miramar, the two key uh, Tomcat bases, and they gave them T2s because they knew the T2, you can go do anything to this airplane, and you can actually put in the same controls that you would in a Tomcat to recover. So you can literally mm-hmm. visually OJT and do do it all, and you actually had to do it every year. And you, when you're in when you're in a fleet squad operational squadron to maintain that that yeah you know, that safety because there's always a safety margin. And uh, I tell you, it's just, it was such a trip to to do because first of all, when you go now you're in the T2, you're a fleet guy. You're not having to worry about getting those downs and grades because you're all working for the grades to try to get to the fire community. It's like now you're one of them, you know. So you get up there. And it's really cool. So the guys that ran it were awesome. And they, you know, so we do all the stuff. We do all these different out of control maneuvers and try and literally get, get you into a flat spin, a up, sort of upright spin. You can recover like that. Well, we did it all. And I remember the guy comes and he goes, he goes, well, hey, you did it all. You, you, you passed. He goes, you still got some gas. But you, you want to do anything else? I said, well, no. Nah. And he goes, well, he goes, have you ever done a launch of rock? And I said, what? I said, this thing could do a lunch I go, yeah, watch this. And, you know, when you get a jet out of control in all three axes where it's just tumbling, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's a riot. It's, it is so cool. So, yeah, I'd love to buy a T2. If I could get one, I'd buy it in a moment. You know, take my <laughs> wife. <laughs> Maybe watch the space in a few years. But, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, Mark, so yeah, so one aircraft you wish you could have flown in your military career that you didn't get the chance to? Uh, the, the Viper, the uh, the F-16N. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the big aggressor, motor. Yeah, the, the aggressor squadron, has, actually Top Gun has them today. Uh, I had a lot of buddies that uh, that were in the fleet squadron with me and the Art yeah. that went and flew them. In fact, one guy, I'll tell you, I'm not going to mention his name because he, 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 he's like, you, he, he, he give me crap. You know, the, uh, but he's a good friend. He's a close friend. And what had, ended up happening was our, my last flight in the Aardvarks. They go, they, you know, they go, hey, this, this is your last flight. What do you want to do? I said, 1v1. And, and I said, he goes, and you name who you want to go against. And so I, you know, I. I made my two my two best friends in there because you never know who had the duty or they couldn't do it or like that one. So he, he he gives me one of my best friends. So we go up there and we do a you know it's a typical one v one ACM thing, and um, I ended up gunning him twice. It, you know, wow. it's usually sometimes it's it's hard to beat, especially if you find a guy that's really good. He was a top gun grad. I mean, it's it's. It's it's hard to if someone's very skilled, it's hard to beat, and you end up just getting into a Luffberry, and you basically it's a it's a draw to get two gun kills, 
it was like that's wow you know yeah. i couldn't believe it you know it's like well wow i just yeah, but it's like golf some days you're just right on some days you're yeah, off and it, yeah, it was, yeah. it just, it just, it, that day i was on that day he was off well the funny thing was he got back to me because next thing you know i'm in dallas flying the uh you know in the, with that squadron and that's why i was telling you about how they were Qual- the, the aggressor squadrons were qualifying the reserve squadrons to take over the adversary mission. So we're down in Key West, the, 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 you know, the, the Dallas squadron in, in Tomcats, and he's there in his F-16N because now he's in the aggressor squadron. And now I'm going against him in Tomcat and F-16N, and he had my lunch all day. <laughs> that thing, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it is a beast. It's a 9G fighter. And, you know, the, the thing about that was – one thing I learned from it, you know, you always take away your, your, your takeaways is, is if I saw that, I just run because, I mean, well, you don't know who's in it because that's what drives anything. But chances are you have to bet on the worst. And the worst is it could be a guy that knows how to fly this thing. And you're, you're are going to have your ass handed to you every time. Yeah, I've heard that before with you. You cannot go against that, that greater uh, 101 thrust, the 9Gs, you know, in an in a old, you know, it just ain't going to work out for me. So, but no, he, he, he had me, he, he got payback times a couple. <laughs> well, what a great story to end the interview on, but uh, yeah, I'm going to link all the descriptions and the links that you mentioned before, Mark, but thank you very much for coming on the channel. It's been a pleasure talking to you. So thank my, you my very pleasure. much. And have a great time uh, talking to my brother. Like I said, it's, uh, you know, I, I really feel like uh, we were blessed, uh, the Viscara dynasty has been blessed to have uh, had the opportunity to one serve our country, but then to serve it the way we did with, uh, with, by flying the, the world's best fighters. It's just that it doesn't get any better than that, and it's just a blessing. So uh, I think you'll have a really great time with, it, with my brother as well. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.